Okay, so we are in the lecture for uh, Thursday, the 18th of February, 2021, for European history. Uh, presumably, you all have your notes out, and we are ready to go. In your notes pack, you will see a couple of charts. Unless I have forgotten my own notes. These are not maps, although they're after the maps section. They are charts. What they look like is, well, we'll start with this one. It's a full page chart of the British Empire. Ooh, there. Okay. And it says the British Empire to 1914. And what you will see is that the British Empire contains Canada, New Zealand, Fiji, New Cal oh, let's see, uh, Australia, Tasmania, uh, Hong Kong, as well as other concessions along the Chinese coast, Singapore, the Malay states in North Borneo, Burma, British India, which includes uh, Bangladesh and Pakistan. Aden, a swath of Nile territory going from Egypt in the north to Kenya in the south. Rhodesia, Bechuanaland, the Union of South Africa. Nigeria, the Gold Coast, which is now Ghana. Sierra Leone, Mount Lyon. The Gambia, which is a river colony. Down south of the South American uh, mainland, there's the Falkland Islands, South Georgia, the South Sandwich Islands. There is St. Helena and Ascension Island in the Central Atlantic. And, uh, of course, there are the British Isles uh, at home, which included in 1914 Ireland as well as Britain. Britain being a combination of England, Scotland, and Wales. It also included bases in Cyprus, on Malta, and on Gibraltar, Gibraltar in the Mediterranean Sea. So, when they say that the sun never sets on the British Empire, they ain't just a woofing. They are not speaking symbolically. Because... At its height, the British Empire was always always had territory facing the sun. Ooh, I forgot British Honduras, which today is called Belize. Uh, let's see. Oh, and British Guiana. Uh, and the West Indies, Jamaica, Trinidad, the Bahamas, and Bermuda. How could I forget those North American colonies so close to us? The sun literally never set on the British Empire because British territory was always, at one point, regardless of the orientation of the earth, facing the sun. That's amazing. Look at the population graph down in the bottom center of that map. Let's see. So Great Britain is the little guy on the left. The colonial population is the bigger guy on the right. The ratio is for every Briton, man, woman, and child, there are 7.7 .7 colonials. Where do you think most of these live? India. Because India was and is an incredibly populous uh, region of the globe. But there are still large populations in the British Chinese territories as well. Africa had some, but not nearly as many as they have today. Now, in terms of land area, you know, tiny Britain is that itty bitty box. For every acre of British soil, there are 84 acres of colonial territory that Britain controls. What? It says island. I think it says Okay, you've got better eyes than I do. I'm sorry. 94! That makes it even more amazing how that little tiny island takes over so much of the world to the point where close to 25% of the world's population, that's one person in four, is under British rule. 
it's actually 23%, but I can average up. A quarter of the world's population, about. A fifth of the world's landmass. For every square mile of land on Earth, for every five square miles of land on Earth, I forget my math because I'm not a math teacher, uh, one of those square miles is controlled by Britain. For every four people on the planet at that time, one in four of them, about, was uh, part of the British Empire. It's the biggest empire in human history, by far. Now, how is it different from the land empires and the pre-industrial empires that came before? Well, I just told you some of the big differences. The Mongol Empire, the <coughs> Chinese Empire, under the Qing and under the Tang dynasties when it was large. Uh, the Muslim Empires, the... Uh, Oh, let's see, the Abbasid Caliphate, before that, the Umayyad Caliphate. Um, the Roman Empire, Alexander's Empire, the Persian Empire, Ashoka's Empire in India. All of these empires are land empires brought about by conquering peoples, usually on horseback. Even in prehistory, the Indo-European peoples, which brought the Indo-European language group to almost everywhere except the Basque territory and parts of Romania, uh, in, in early Europe, were a uh, land invasion by people of the horse. So the British Empire and the other late 19th century European empires, early 20th century, are fundamentally different in that here the conquerors come by sea. And because Britannia rules the waves, Britain's empire is the greatest because the British are the first human nation to industrialize. The British are the greatest of these. But they all follow the British pattern. Another thing, because they're maritime empires, and because part of the goal of these empires is to assure some degree of economic autarky. Now, I don't know if you've taken economics, and I am spelling autarky in, a, in an odd, particular way. <coughs> A-U-T-A-R-K-Y. I've mentioned this before. Do any of you know what autarky, in an economic term sense, is? Oh, if you take Mr. Hall's class, he's going to be disappointed. Autarky is economic self-sufficiency. A-U-T-A-R-K-Y is economic self-sufficiency. China had a variant of autarky before the Industrial Age because China had basically everything it needed within its own orbit. It didn't really require foreign trade. The United States, unlike any European country, with our resources, we have most everything we need. We benefit from foreign trade, but the American Republic could get along without it. China, at that time, could get along without it. Um, we're better off with it, so were they. Um, but that means you want a variety of resources in your empire. Now, this isn't mercantilism. Mercantilism required everyone to buy from, if you're in the British territories, British authorized traders. The Brits learned from the American Rebellion of the 13 colonies not to do that. But uh, even though the British Empire stands for free trade, they secured colonies around the world that could provide them with different resources just in case and to diversify their portfolio. So they take rubber trees from South America and transplant them in the Malay states north of Singapore. Why? Because they grow really well there. And to this day, uh, the, uh, Malaysia, as we call it today, is one of the world's great sources of rubber. The British get gold and diamonds and other minerals, including copper, from their South African, Bechuanaland, and Rhodesian colonies. 
They get uh, cacao beans and chicle from the Gold Coast. Um, they get oil from uh, their allies in the Persian Gulf. And what this doesn't show is the British relationship to the Ottoman Empire and to the Persian Empire, uh, the, the, the country we now call Iran. Um, they get cotton at first from the southern United States, and that's still, but they also get a lot of their cotton from Egypt and especially from India. Uh, they get a lot of spices, including tea from India. They get access to opium in India. Uh, there are all sorts of resources that come from these colonies around the world. The point of having so many colonies, they get sugar from Jamaica, the West Indies. Uh, the point of having colonies all around the world, in part, is to give you a degree of economic autarky, to give you uh, access to resources within your own power base, within your own sphere of influence, so that you can't be cut off. That's the great fear of Britain. The great fear of Britain is exacerbated because by this point, there is no way, even if every acre of farmable soil was turned into the most efficient sort of food production in the British Isles, there'd be mega death. Every single day, the British import massive tons of foodstuffs just to keep their people alive. This ended up being a key point in both world wars because the Germans were keenly aware of this and they sunk as many ships going into Britain as they possibly could. And they came, it was the one thing Churchill thought could break defeat to Britain. The cutting off of food supplies because of submarine attacks. So Britain controls the waves, Britain expands the empire to get resources, but that's not all. Britain is also expanding the empire because ocean travel is changing. Sailing ships are being replaced by steamships. Steamships are usually powered in these era in this day by coal. Coal is bulky, it is messy. You can get anthracite or bituminous coal. I think anthracite I think anthracite is the better of the two. One of them burns much hotter and much cleaner than the other. Whenever a ship had to coal, all hands were involved. The captain personally directed, and everywhere on the ship was filled with as much coal as they could as they could as they could put. It wasn't just put in coal bunkers. So coal dust got everywhere. Everything got filthy. So whenever you coaled the ship, it was two or three days of backbreaking labor, followed by another day or two of backbreaking labor to clean the ship up because it had become a filthy mess. But coal is a finite resource. Oil is much more efficient. That's why, for the most part, we use oil today, or even natural, natural gas. So what do you need now that you're using steamships steam that you didn't need in the past? You need coaling stations. Coaling stations all over the world. And so the Falkland Islands is important, down near the tip of South America. Not only do you get you have sheep farmers there from, from Scotland, who still live there, because the Falklands are still British. Stick it, Argentina! Ha! The Falklands are still British. The Argies tried taking away the Falklands in 1982-83, and they failed. Um, the Falkland Islands was set up and important because it was a Navy base and a coaling station. South Africa, Cape Town. Uh, the area uh, near Zanzibar and Kenya on the East African coast, the Maldive Islands. Uh, all of these areas were set up as coaling stations so that British merchant vessels and British warships could <coughs> fuel up any time they needed to so that they would not be caught out in the middle of the ocean without enough fuel to do what they needed to do. They always had a place relatively nearby, a friendly point port where they could nip in, fuel up, get new ammunition, uh, get more food, whatever. So the British Empire is not just set up to achieve uh, resource independence, which it, it, it's nice to have, but the British believe more in free trade than, than autarky. They just wanted to have the option. But it's also set up to establish 
control over the strategic choke points of the world. With the Falkland Islands, the British can control the seaway south of South America. With Jamaica and the West Indies, Bahamas and Bermuda, they can, uh, if, if we let them, uh, control the access to the Panama Canal from the Atlantic side. Um, from Fiji to New Zealand to Australia to Singapore, Singapore is a choke point of world trade to this day. If you had to find the biggest choke point in world trade that wasn't the Suez Canal or the Panama Canal, the uh, Malacca Strait south of Singapore is that choke point, and the British control Singapore. All of this is about controlling the choke points of global trade, having Navy bases right along it. Because if you have Navy bases along the routes of global trade, it's like having a straight razor at the throat of potential enemies. You know who people are really polite to, men are really polite to? The barber. When they're getting an old-fashioned shave. I Back before I grew the beard, I had that a few times because it's different and it's, it's very relaxing if you trust the barber. If you don't trust the barber, it's Sweeney Todd time, which is cannibal fears and fears of getting your neck sliced, which is not a happy moment. But trust me, when you are talking to a man that has a straight razor scraping along the skin of your throat, you don't insult him. You don't make him angry. You also don't make him laugh too hard. Okay? Conversation becomes very calm because otherwise accidents can happen. The British do this with global trade. And they benefit from all of this. It's an investment that they think is well worth it and that does in fact pay off. Let's talk about the other choke points. The Panama Canal is built by the Americans uh, and completed in 1914, the year World War I starts. Before that, you either have to <coughs> ship your goods to Panama, offload it to rail cars, ship it across the Panamanian Railway, and unload it to ships in the Pacific, which, which is what a lot of people do. Or you can go all the way around South America. There is no way north of North America in those days. So um, Panama is the key choke point. But uh, Teddy Roosevelt takes Panama away from Colombia, <laughs> uh, creating a Panamanian independent nation, which still exists, and uh, gets the Panama Canal Zone, which is American territory until the late 1970s when Jimmy Carter, in his progressive wisdom, gave it to the Panamanians. In any event, uh, Panamanians decided to become anti-American in the 1980s, and we conquered the place and put a new government in. Why? Because we're not going to let a hostile government control the Panama Canal. Panama Canal is ours, we built it, it's in our backyard, and it, control, it is a major choke point of world trade, and it's also important to our Navy strategy. I guess we need to be able to shift ships from the Atlantic to the Pacific quickly. So, politics being politics, power being power, the Panamanian government will, in perpetuity, so long as the United States is a world power, be friendly to the United States one way or another. The British and the French have a similar experience earlier than we do in Egypt. Officially, Egypt is part of the Ottoman Empire. But, in the early 1800s, an Egyptian... Uh, Egypt, Egypt has always been semi-independent. And there's an Egyptian ruler named Muhammad Ali, who's not the boxer, um, who uh, breaks away from Ottoman control in the early 1800s and actually tries to establish an empire in the Eastern Mediterranean. He ends up getting overthrown. But Egypt is still semi-independent under a ruler called the Khedive. In the middle 1800s, the French begin investing heavily in Egypt. And they get the Khedive to agree to the French under a guy named de Lesseps to build a canal at Suez 
from the Mediterranean Sea to the Red Sea. But the French don't control the Mediterranean, and uh, the British, once the canal is completed, take over. They replace the Khedive with their own government, and the French are paid off by getting co-ownership in the canal and by being able to reap a lot of the monetary profits of the canal. Why don't the British let their sometimes ally, the French, control the canal? Because the canal is the single most important waterway in the world, just as the most dangerous waterway is south of South America, uh, between South America and the, and, the, and the Antarctic Peninsula. The most important waterway on Earth is the Suez Canal. You know why. You can see a map. Anyone who wants to travel from Europe to South or East Asia has either to go around Africa, which is much bigger than it seems to be on most maps, because maps always distort, and the maps that we typically use tend to shrink the equatorial regions of the world. Africa is huge. It takes months to go around it, even with fast shipping. So using the Suez Canal cuts months of time off every journey. Therefore, anyone who wants to trade across Eurasia by sea is going to use the, the, uh, the, the Suez Canal. As such, whoever controls the Suez Canal controls that trade. There is no way on God's green earth that the British Empire, whose claim to power and fame is their sea power, is going to allow anyone else to control the Suez Canal. The French built it, the British let them, the British took it over, they let the French reap monetary profits, the British got strategic control. And because of their need to control the Suez Canal, Britain became the dominant power in Egypt. But Egypt is down the Nile River from the Sudan, which is a, and was a barbarous place and in the late 1800s, they had an Islamic messiah there known as the Mahdi. Mahdi is a Sunni Islamic concept for the Islamic messiah. And they believed that a Sudanese chieftain was the messiah. The Mahdi commanded soldiers that the British called fuzzy wuzzies or whirling dervishes uh, because these guys were fanatical jihadis. The Brits sent an army south to the Sudan to deal with the Mahdi in the 1880s under a guy named Gordon, and they were slaughtered. And finally, in 1898, the British send another army south under a guy named Kitchener, and they have victory. In that battle of Omdurman in 1898, the last cavalry charge in the history of the British army, a young Winston Churchill personally took part. Took part. He's the man who ultimately will save the world by not surrendering to the Nazis in 1940. Why did the British take over the Sudan? Because the Sudan controlled Egypt's water supply. And without the Nile River, Egypt dies. This is a problem today, by the way. Um, the British further realized they needed to have at least a friendly power in Abyssinia, what we call Ethiopia. That's the source of the... Blue Nile, and the White Nile, who knows what the source is. So the British have a good relationship with the Emperor of Abyssinia, and they control the source of the Blue Nile. As to the White Nile, they keep going south, and eventually they take Uganda and Kenya, not just for their own sakes, they take Uganda and Kenya, because the source of the White Nile, I think it's the White Nile, maybe, I think it's the White Nile, the source of the White Nile, the source of the Big Nile, is uh, Lake Victoria, that big lake in East Africa. And Lake Victoria has a number of things feeding into it. 
So with Uganda in the north and Kenya in the east, the British control Lake Victoria. With control of Burundi and Rwanda, the British control the sources of the Nile. So one of the reasons for Britain to go far, that far south into Africa is to control the source of the Nile River. Here's another. I've told you this. Do any of you remember what other reason the British go up the Nile to try to take this band of land uh, between the bulk of Africa and the Middle East? I had a heart sad right now. Mon cure as, how do you say sad in front case? My, my heart is sad. Mon cure is despondent. Whatever. Yeah. Could be trading between Africa and the Middle East? In what? You're right. The question is in what? Uh, what? The Sahara Desert. What? The Sahara Desert or the Red Sea? It's not, it's not just general trade. What kind of trade don't the British like very much after Wilberforce? Slavery? Yes! <laughs> to this day in Saudi Arabia and the Arabian Gulf states, black slavery exists. It exists now. There are black slaves there now. They call them servants. They are slaves. The Arabs, if they can afford it, like having black African slaves. They did at this time. The British did not like that. So what the British did is they took control of this territory to interrupt the slave trade from Central Africa to the Arabian regions of the world. And for a while, it actually did. It didn't stop the trade. It made it more expensive and more difficult, which the British had to settle for. Um, so they, in part, went up the Nile to find the source of the Nile and to make sure they had control of it. Because with the control of the Nile, they controlled Egypt. With the control of Egypt, they controlled the Suez Canal. With the control of the Suez Canal, they controlled global trade. Uh, but they also go up the Nile to uh, fight an anti-slavery crusade and make it harder and harder for the Arabs to buy their black slaves. Um, India is self-explanatory. They don't call, and, and again, India is bigger than it looks on that map. They don't call India the subcontinent for nothing. Uh, India has, is another region that basically has everything it needs. It benefits from world trade because it has always had a population problem. But basically India, the Indian subcontinent region, is somewhat independent just as the United States is, just as China is. Britain ends up taking over all of it. And with British India, the wealth and power of British industry expands exponentially. India is a source for cotton. India is a source for food. India is a source for all sorts of other raw materials. When the British need labor, they import Indian labor. You know who has a large proportion of Indian, Asian Indians? Black African countries that were once part of the British Empire. Because in the late 1800s and early 1900s, massive numbers of itinerant Indian workers ended up settling there. Um, so Sub-Saharan Africa has ethnic tensions between Asian Indians and native blacks. Um, India is called the jewel in the crown of the empire because it is such a source of wealth. Now, all of this empire building does not go without criticism. In Britain, there were, in the 19th century, two major political parties, as there are today. Today, the two parties are the Conservative Party, or the Tories, and the Labour Party, or the Socialists. But back in the 19th century, it was the Conservative Party, the Tories, versus the Liberal Party. Now, there were exceptions. There were imperialistic liberals, and there were some conservatives that didn't believe in the whole hog expansion of the British Empire. But in general terms, there were two factions in uh, British politics, and they were typified by two prime ministers that basically traded the office back and forth for like 20 years. One was prime minister, then the other one was prime minister, then the other one was prime minister, back and forth. Okay. The Conservative Party 
tended to be pro-imperialist. And their uh, champion was Prime Minister Benjamin Disraeli. Yep, the Prime Minister of Great Britain at the height of Victorian imperial expansion is a former Jew or somebody who comes from a former Jewish family. This should tell you something about the British not being especially anti-Semitic as compared to other European societies. Benjamin, very Jewish name, Disraeli, that's the word Israeli with a D in front of it, like a French D, like of Israel. His family became convert converts to the Anglican Church, uh, and Disraeli himself was an Anglican, but of Jewish background, and when you see pictures of him, uh, he looks very, very classically Jewish. Disraeli was at the heart of the imperialist faction within the conservative party. You have a hair right at the edge of your sight that just sort of tips in. And, I'm here, I'm not, I'm here. I'm not. Um, so Disraeli is behind a lot of the imperial expansion. He believes that to the extent British lands can expand, the British uh, people will be enriched and the British Empire will be strengthened. If the British Empire is strong, no one will think to attack us. So by growing the empire, we become wealthier. That wealth that in, that in, enriches our people. I was about to say and wealthifies. That's not a word, but that won't stop me. And um, the um, expansion of British power that the empire will bring and demonstrate will discourage foreign enemies. That's the imperialist faction of conservative Benjamin Disraeli. But then there's William Gladstone. William Gladstone looks like a stereotypical fire and brimstone preacher. And these lights make it impossible for me to ignore. Sorry. He's grooming himself on camera. Yep. Uh, okay. Gladstone is this severe faced, white haired fellow with intense eyes. And he is the head, not only of the Liberal Party, but of what people might derisively call the Little Englanders. Gladstone doesn't want an empire. Gladstone believes that uh, Britain should be about England. Little Englanders. Gladstone says, you want to call me a Little Englander? Fine. If you think that uh, a Little Englander cares more about the British people than anyone else, then call me a Little Englander. If you think that our goal of social reform within England is more important than your goal of taking territory in the exotic tropics, then call me a Little Englander. I'm a Little Englander because I don't believe that the destiny of Britain is to be found out there in the tropics. I think it's to be found by making a better society here at home. Does this sound familiar? Liberal versus conservative. Conservatives tend to be more willing to engage in an aggressive foreign policy that will strengthen the United States and dissuade our enemies, a la Trump. On the other hand, uh, there is a strong group within the society that says, no, 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 we will not find our destiny overseas. What matters is reforming and improving and making progress in our society here at home. That tends to be liberals and Democrats and the Bible. So, there is a debate between imperialists and Little Englanders, between conservatives and liberals, between Disraeli and Gladstone, uh, over the course of British imperial progress. But ultimately, Gladstone fails because you see the size of the British Empire. Now, in 1897, Queen Victoria has her diamond, diamond jubilee. She took power when her father died, her uncle died, in 1837. So that's 47, 57, 67, 70, 70. It's her 60th anniversary as queen. And, you know, she's older than most people in, the, in that day and age. And she's frail, and people know she's not going to last too many more years. She lasts another four years. But at her diamond jubilee, the British Empire comes together. In a, in a very special way. From all over the world, in real time, telegraphic messages 
Come, greetings from the people of Quebec in French, Quebecois French. Greetings from the people of Canada, come from Toronto and Vancouver. Greetings from the people of Jamaica, from Bahamas, from Bermuda, from Trinidad and Tobago and Guyana. Greetings from the people of the Falkland Islands. Greetings from the people of South Africa. Greetings from the people of Ghana, from Kenya, from Egypt, from Aden, from Calcutta, India, the capital of British India from Singapore, from Australia, from Hong Kong. Greetings from the people of Fiji, from all over the world. Yeah, if I wasn't clumsy, it wouldn't have happened in the first place. Couldn't plan that. Greetings from people all over the world, in real time. This has never happened before. And to think about the very different types of places that are sending these greetings. There was a naval review showing the mass power of the British fleet. And within nine years, all of these ships would be obsolete. That's how quickly naval technology was progressing. But in 1897, you have this mass of what are called pre-dreadnought battleships. Um, none of them have sails. All of them have big guns of one kind or another. And uh, they're all powered by coal and steam. It is sort of a high point of the British power. Uh, of British power. Now, the Germans want this. Let's flip to the next page. The other imperial power is the French. Uh, at first, the Dutch Empire has stagnated. It basically controls uh, the Dutch East Indies, which we now call Indonesia. And there are a few colonies elsewhere. But the Dutch are basically stagnant. The Spanish and Portuguese lost their empires to the, the Portuguese lost theirs to the Dutch, and the Spanish lost theirs to the American revolutionaries in Central and South America, and uh, to the Americans uh, when we took Guam and the Philippines, Cuba, and Puerto Rico away from them. Um, so, France is, besides Britain, the only other, you know, early empire that still has lots of territory. So look at the French colonial empire. Uh, they control most of West Africa, including much of the Sahara Desert. Going west, they control islands like Martinique, they control French Guiana, which is still a French colony to this day. Um, they control a number of areas in the Central Pacific, Central South Pacific, uh, like uh, Tahiti. They control areas like New Caledonia and the New Hebrides off the coasts of Australia and New Zealand. They control French Indochina, which is probably their greatest colony outside of Africa. French Indochina later becomes Laos, Cambodia, and Vietnam. Uh, it's called Indochina because it has influences from China to the north and India to the west. They also control a few cities in India that the British let them keep, like Pondicherry. And um, they control parts of, well, they control what we now call Djibouti, one of the two funniest places to teach seventh graders about you teach geography. There's Djibouti and there's Lake Titicaca, and both of them get big laughs, big laughs with the second grade. So, in any event, oh, and they control Madagascar, where, um, you know, weird root-like plants exist, um, and a number of islands in the uh, Indian Ocean. And, of course, they control France. Um, the heart of the French Empire in North Africa is Algeria. And the story of the French in Algeria is something we'll continue when we do the late 20th century. But Germany has a new Kaiser in the early 1990s. And when the Kaiser starts making speeches to the world and to the German people and to his beloved army, he says that we deserve a place in the sun. And from now on, it's going to be full steam ahead. What Kaiser Wilhelm wants... And what a restless Germany seems to want is respect. They want respect. They want respect from the British. They have this inferiority complex with the British, particularly the Kaiser himself, because he's good at Queen Vic's uh, grandson. So the Kaiser wants an empire, and he wants a battle fleet. 
The problem is, by the time the Kaiser takes over Germany, most of the good land has already been taken. So there's this sense of resentment that the Germans have. So where does Germany end up uh, getting territory? Well, they make a few false starts in Morocco, places like Tangier, Agadir, and Algeciras. Uh, and they fail. Uh, Morocco, Morocco remains Spanish and French. They take over uh, German Togo land, which is now split between British uh, Gold Coast and, and Ghana and a little country called Togo. They take over Cameroon. Um, German Southwest Africa is what we now call Namibia. German East Africa is what we now call Tanzania. That's not much of Africa. Where the Germans really get territory, well, they get the city of Tingtao in China on the Shantung Peninsula. Uh, and they get a bunch of Pacific Island territory in the central western Pacific. They get part of New Guinea, part of Papua New Guinea, which they call Kaiser Wilhelm Land. They get the Bismarck Archipelago, which is a major battleground from World War II between us and the Japanese. They get the Caroline Islands, the Marshall Islands, the Marianas Islands, the Palau Islands, and the Caroline Islands, if I didn't already mention that. These areas become Japanese and Australian after World War I, and they end up being conquered by the Japanese, many of them at least, during World War II, which means we need to conquer them back in World War II. So Germans, Germany's empire is smaller than the French, and much smaller much smaller than the British. And what this is going to do is it's going to make the Germans naughty boys. The naughty boys of Germany are going to try to make trouble in places like the Philippines. When it looks like the Spanish are going to get kicked out by the Americans, and then the idealistic Americans are going to let the Filipinos have independence, the Germans are right there. <sighs> we want it, my precious. We want the Philippines. And when we break our words to the Filipinos, the, uh, the Germans are angry and they leave. They pull the same thing with the Spanish in Morocco on, on three occasions uh, and fail all three times. They, they're embarrassed. Um, in South Africa, you're going to learn that there's a major problem between white groups, the Boers, who are Dutch Africans who land there in the 1600s, the English Africans who land there in the 1800s, the Zulu and other black African tribes who live there. And South America is going to be a site of many, many wars. And throughout all of them, the Germans are there saying, ooh, Boers, ooh, Dutch, African Dutch, you know, Dutch and Deutsch, not very different, same word, same basic language, you should join us. So the Germans are constantly trying to stir up trouble. And this, this willingness to stir up trouble makes them truly disliked by many of the other countries, especially the British. Books can change the world. They can't. And one of the most important books that you've probably never heard of yet was written by an American uh, teacher at our Naval Academy in Annapolis. He eventually becomes an admiral. His name is Alfred Thayer Mahan. Alfred Thayer Mahan writes a book called The Influence of Sea Power Upon History. And Mahan's thesis is in studying the wars between the British and the Dutch and the French uh, and the Spanish from the 15 and 1600s up through the Napoleonic Wars. What happens is that some navies try to take over the merchant trade and they delude themselves. Because in all of these wars there are big naval battles involving battleships, line of battleships, big heavy ships with lots of guns. And whoever wins those big navy battles, like the Battle of Trafalgar is the classic example of this, controls the sea. And if you control the sea, you control the trade. Going after enemy trade is sort of what second class navies do. What first class navies do is they build a battle fleet. They wait until somebody is stupid enough to go to war with them. And then they club them with their battle fleet and destroy the enemy battle fleet and control the seas. And 
If you control the seas, you control the world's trade, and if you control the world's trade, you become like Britain, the dominant power in the world. So in modern times, the key to world power is battleships. Now that may seem strange to you, but remember, there's no air power yet. There's no, there are no practical submarines yet. What wins Navy battles is surface warships. Surface warships with lots of armor and big guns that can be fast enough to be practical. And what the influence of sea power upon history does is it convinces everyone, the Japanese, the Americans, the French, the British, the Russians, to build battleships. Because if you build battleships, you'll be ready to win a decisive Navy battle. And if you win a decisive Navy battle, you get, you get sea power. And if you get sea power, you get control over trade. And if you get control over trade, you have more money to build more battleships. See how it works? So Thayer's, uh, Thayer Mahan's, Mahan's uh, thesis is read by every world leader. It is the book for like 20 years from the time it was written in the 1890s up through World War I. Everyone who cared about national power would read this book, or at least say they read the book, about the obscure naval history, and they would advocate the thesis that Mahan said. So the size of navies begins to blossom because everyone who accepts Mahan's thesis wants to build battleships. Particularly, this applies to Kaiser Wilhelm and the Germans, because Kaiser Wilhelm and the journal, Germans want to challenge Queen Victoria's England and, and the England after her. And if Mahan is right, you challenge them by building a battle fleet. So the Germans start building a battle fleet in a colonial empire. Even though Bismarck said Germany does, needs neither of those things, Germany needs a strong army to deal with Russia and Austria and France. Who's right? Well, we'll believe that. Now, how is it that Britain can, and the others can get all of this power? Well, one answer to that is this. I've mentioned it to you before. Quinine. What is quinine? Have any of you ever seen quinine water in your in your uh, in your closets? Usually, it's near club soda, the booze. I think your family's happy. Quinine water is often today called tonic water. They're very very similar, and. Quinine is a chemical that can reduce or eliminate a person's susceptibility to deadly malaria. Deadly malaria is a sleeping sickness spread by mosquitoes. If a mosquito bites you and it's malarial, it could pass the sleeping sickness to you. When you have it, you end up going to in this, into this weird semi-conscious state, which could last for weeks. In the meantime, your body flares up with fever and then gets cold, and flares up with fever and then gets cold, because what your body is trying to do, desperately trying to do, is fight off this sleeping sickness as if it's an infection. And the way the body does that is to play chicken with itself. I'm gonna get so hot, virus is gonna die. You're gonna get so hot, you're gonna die. We'll see. <laughs> That's basically what happens when you have a fever. Your body is challenging the virus. Who can live through this? I'm a whole body. You're a stinking virus. Yeah, but it's really tough. We'll see. We'll see what happens. Sleeping sickness makes it impossible for people who aren't native to the tropics to live there. And frankly, the people who are native to the tropics have a low birth rate, or no, they have a, they, their, their population is controlled because they still get it they still get this disease, but they're used to it. Without quinine, the tropical jungles of Central uh, South America and Sub-Saharan Africa and Asia and the islands are basically impenetrable. The Europeans can set up cities on the coast 
and hope that the prevailing winds from the ocean and, you know, being somewhat away from the jungle a few hundred yards or whatever will be enough to keep the death by sleeping sickness down. But you go into that jungle, you're going to die. But in the middle to late 1800s, the Europeans developed quinine. Now, the British famously take their quinine with gin. The famous gin and tonic is born. And that's because quinine doesn't taste very good. If you ever sip on tonic water, you can, you can taste how unpleasant it tastes. But people develop a taste for it because it's the taste of survival. And, you know, if you can take your medicine with a little booze, why not? So the British uh, and other Europeans get access to quinine. And with quinine, they have access to the tropics. This produces what is called the scramble for Africa. The scramble for Africa happens in the late 1800s, and basically, here's the story. See that map of Africa over there? Behind Miss Woodward. Uh, except for the area of the Sahara and the very southern tip, Africa basically is only contacted on the coastal plains uh, by outsiders, by Europeans. That's in, say, 1830 or so. By 19... 14, the entire continent was taken over except for two countries. Uh, Ethiopia, because it was Christian and there was nothing there, and the British already had a disagreement, and Liberia, which is a country in West Africa that was ruled by Americanized former slaves that were sent back to Africa and ruled over the natives as if they were white. So you have colonial empires carve up the entire continent of Africa. Why does that happen in so short a time, basically less than 30 years? Africa goes from being unoccupied, wild and free, and savage and primitive and brutal, to uh, imperial colonies, less than 30 years. Why not? Why not is one answer. Uh, another answer is... Um, cartridge firearms. Before cartridge firearms, to load a weapon, you'd have to pour gunpowder in, tamp it down, load a musket ball, tamp it down, have, have a flint and a, some gunpowder in your firing pan, and you squeeze the trigger and the flint hits the fire, uh, uh, a sparking bit of steel, and sparks go into the firing pan, and spsh, and boom. And at best, you could shoot maybe two or three shots a minute if you were extreme proficient. At best. Usually it was about a shot. And muskets were not very reliable. Even rifle muskets. But the idea of the cartridge is instead of just having the bullet... Oh, and they worked out a conical bullet like we use today. Musket balls were round. But they worked out a conical bullet. And behind that bullet... Wait! is a metal box with a firing pin and a bunch of gunpowder inside. And what you do is you load what we call bullets into a gun, and you shoot it, firing pin goes boom, bullet shoots out, and then you got to get rid of the spent cartridge, and it's much easier. So the Europeans conquer Africa with quinine and cartridge fire. Now, thank you. Have a wonderful weekend. And I'll see you tomorrow in video or for the lesson.